that we were we represented one of the producers who produced one of the songs for 50 cents in the club hey guys attorney darren miller and you're watching my channel d law okay so after law school i kind of had to figure out exactly what i wanted to try and do okay one thing i knew for sure was that i was going to work for myself i was not going to be working for somebody else i had done that before i had gotten experience in, in law school i had seen a number of different things um, and i decided this was what i was going to do um, and what kind of brought me to that, that conclusion with regards to working for myself, was I was working for this law firm called Moriarty & Associates. Moriarty & Associates was a mass tort law firm. And I remember from time to time during law school, it was a situation where, you know, sometimes we kind of question, are we going to get paid? You guys are getting paid? It's that and the other. But we were working on this really big and potentially lucrative case. While I was in law school, um, or after I had graduated from law school, actually, I opened my mailbox one day, okay? And I'm still in the decision-making process with regards to what am I going to do and what's the plan and you know, how's exactly, how's it going to look? And keep in mind, at the time, I was probably making, you know, $10, $12 an hour as a, as a student. I opened my mailbox one day and there was a check in there for $10,000. And it was made out to me. And I'm like, whoa. $10,000. And so it was a check from the law firm. And it turned, so I got the check and I was so excited and I, I wasn't expecting it. And I took it down to the office and I talked to uh, Kevin Leindecker and I said, Kevin, what's this for? He goes, to have the case that we worked on that you helped with. It got resolved. And the case got resolved for $117 million. Oh, is it hot in here? Of that, the law, the attorneys made 40% of that, okay? So right then and there, I said, you know what? I'm going to stay broke. Help me, I'm poor. Until I can figure this out for myself. Because I knew if I went to go work for a law firm, there was no way I was gonna be making that type of money. And so, after being in school for the last 10 years, I was used to being broke. So I made a decision at that point I'm going to stay working for myself until I can figure out how I can make it on my own. If I was going to be working for myself, what was I exactly going to be doing? I didn't have a lot of experience doing anything other than working with Mass Tort, and certainly I could be a Mass Tort lawyer. So I kind of had to figure that out next, okay? And so one of the first things that I did, um, I started doing some court appointments, uh, some couple of criminal hustles here and there, and of course a little hustling with regards to personal injury. So I did a number of those things because you kind of, as as a freelancer of sorts, you got to keep your, your your options open. And quite frankly, whatever comes in that day is what's going to help to feed your family. So I was just getting experience kind of doing anything. Well, for whatever reason, I kind of dumbed into a situation where I got the opportunity to work doing some entertainment work, entertainment law. And what was very interesting, and, and I got that because while I was in while I was at AM, I did an internship for a, a sports agent, a company called Professional Sports Plan. Um, Carl Poston and his brother Kevin. Uh, they were prominent sports attorneys. Uh, they were representing people like um, Penny Hardaway. Um, you know, y'all remember Little Penny? Um, he was one of their big clients and he made millions upon millions of dollars. He was sponsored by Nike and all kinds of good stuff. And I got to see some of that type of stuff. Um, what I figured out quite quickly was entertainment law was not everything was cracked up. While I did also get to negotiate some NFL contracts and get involved in some of those issues, Again, I found most of my time was dealing with a, a lot of babysitting. You know, I kind of felt like I was babysitting a little at this point. A lot of, hey man, um, I got this DWI, or I'm in this legal trouble, or I'm having these particular problems. And we ended up, it was like cleaning up a whole lot of messes. I'm not, I'm not saying that with regards to Mr. Hardaway, 
he was very clean, he was very tight. But some of our other clients, they were they were getting in trouble, they were getting drunk, they weren't living up to their contractual obligations. And I quickly figured out that was not what I wanted to do. Okay. So after that, then I got to get involved in some other entertainment law. And this was kind of interesting. I got to work with um, South Park Mexico and the Dope House is uh, one of his companies. That was a very interesting experience. I actually started working with him because I was, I was representing a young lady that got assaulted by a member of the Dope House, I will say, I won't say who that is, and we ended up resolving that issue for a bunch of money. And they're like, hey man, we like how you work, we like how you take care of business, Well, so we want you to come work for us. And so I did a lot of stuff for these guys, and it was, it was a really interesting experience watching, uh, watching them develop and seeing their company kind of blow up um, and see them just kind of do all types of different things. And what was really disappointing there, as we all know, is that uh, Carlos, he was young and he loved to get high all the time. He got involved in a number of things that he shouldn't have. And, you know, I remember driving him around one day. We were driving around in his big old bass. And, and I'm like, and I said, Carlos, this car is leased. You're making all this money. I'm a brand new three-year lawyer. And why do I have more money in my bank account than you? That makes no sense. Because as soon as he got it, he would spend it, smoke it, or give it away to his friends. And I'm like, dude. And so I tried to get him to meet with financial advisors and things of that nature. It just didn't work out. And then, of course, we all know what happened with Carlos. Although he was a really good guy, um, he got caught up in some things in the show. So that was my experience there. After dealing with Carlos Coy and South Park Mexican, they kind of, you know, what's interesting here in Houston, that word starts to spread. So then I was then contacted by the manager of uh, MJG and a Ball. Uh, he actually lived out in Sugarland and he heard what I was doing with regards to setting up some of their stuff. And, um, and I started working for him. I actually set up his, his, um, his management company. And then I also set up the publishing company, um, Planning to Act Bad, for uh, MJG and 8 Ball so they could start getting royalties. Uh, from their um, from their recording company and from their different albums and things that they did. So that worked out um, uh, interestingly. And uh, from there, we got more involved. We started doing a bunch of different things for different producers, um, educating some of the artists with regards to what they need to be aware of, uh, doing contracts for them and things of that nature. And I guess our kind of pinnacle, I, I, I would say, was that we were we represented one of the producers who produced one of the songs for 50 Cent's In The Club, in the club uh, album. And so we set up his situation, whereas he was, we did all this paperwork where he was able to get his royalties. And because we were the, uh, we were the, the, the law firm that put together that document, it was really cool because then we started getting royalties as related to his publishing rights. And so for many years, um, you know, twice a year, we'd be getting these really nice checks, these nice big royalty checks, for thousands upon thousands of dollars, because of course 50 Cent was extremely popular and the album was selling like crazy. And so we're still, even now, we're getting checks as related to that years later. I think the last check we got was probably like $16 now. But I mean, it's just a cool story to see that that's still, you're still getting those residuals. So when you see the artists talking about um, making sure their paperwork is right and getting their publishing rights um, so that they can uh, get paid properly, we did all that stuff. That was really cool and interesting. So the entertainment stuff, that was fun, right? But it was very, it's very inconsistent. And when you're dealing with artists, they're up and down, they're in and out, okay? And so they're, I didn't want to build my practice around that. So I would start doing some, I did some of those things in terms of the contracts and negotiations and things of that nature, of that nature which was nice. But I decided, hey, it was time 
I was just, I had just gotten married. Um, I'm gonna have babies on the way and everything else. And I needed to build a solid foundation. At this point, I decided, okay, what was best for me was to move forward with personal injury. Personal injury was something that was up and coming for me. I was really good at it. Uh, had got some really good results with it. Doing the contract here or hustling with a court appointment here or there would help to pay the bills. When I was building up these personal injury cases, that was really knocking out a lot of responsibilities for me in terms of making the bigger money. So I decided at that point, okay, I'm gonna go all in on this. I'm gonna build a firm around personal injury. I'm gonna hire staff. I'm gonna get things organized and I put my process together. So of course I didn't have that much money with which to do a lot with, but that's when I sat down and really just kind of organized things. I put pen to paper with regards to, okay, how is this going to look? How am I gonna get cases? What's gonna happen when those cases come in the door? Who's gonna handle them? Things of that nature, okay? Because one of the things I quickly figured out is that the more times that I'm sitting there behind the desk kind of doing different paperwork, the less time I'm out shaking hands, making different relationships, making, making situations where that more cases are coming in the door. So I, so I took the time then to train with two or three staff that I had to make sure they could take care of a, a number of these responsibilities while I'm out there reigning. That is the, the best way to make things happen. That is the best way for you to be generating business is for you to figure out how do I get people to knock on my door to make my phone ring is by the generation of cases. If you can generate cases, either through social media, through doing good business, through any means necessary, that is the best way to solidify your future in this industry. And that's where it started with me, thinking differently doing different things to evoke a different result. Year three, okay, I'm almost gonna be out of this thing. I knew I was done. I was gonna start preparing for the bar at X period of time. So again, I studying became, again, even less of a priority and getting more experience. Now again, that's not for everybody. There's some people, if you wanna go work for, work for a, a big law firm, you got to have those grades, you got to have those recommendations. If you want to go work for certain, being general counsel for certain firms or for certain companies, grades and those things are important. Again, for myself, doing my own thing, I wasn't going to be reporting to anyone. So practical experience was much more important for me. So you got to game plan these things out from the very beginning. And guys, look, if you want to call me to, to talk about certain suggestions, uh, to think about different things that you can do um, with regards to pointing you in a, in a direction that might help you, I'm glad to do those things. I love it because it creates energy for me, okay? I talked with a student um, a few months ago with, with my assistant, Brittany, and we created so much energy just thinking about what this kid was going through, what he was doing, what he was thinking. And so those types of things I'd be glad to, to talk to you about. But it doesn't have to be me. Talk to anyone out there who's got more experience than you, who's, who's years ahead of you, so that you can learn from those experiences and you can grow from them. Now again, when it comes time to take the bar, take it very seriously. Make sure you're preparing and you've got to put all those other things to the side. You can't work when you're studying for the bar. You can't be messing around with relationships at those times. You have to focus on the bar. You get past this thing. You get past this final hurdle after graduating from school, after getting going through the application process, after dealing with all those professors. That last thing is that, is that bar. And so you got to take it with the utmost priority because boom, once you pass that hurdle, there is nothing stopping you moving forward, okay? And much like myself, who, who's now been able to ha have my own intake company and my own bank and my own real estate companies and everything else, all these things were predicated on focusing in law school, getting that degree, getting as much experience as I could, and then figuring out, okay, what's next? If there's anything I can do to help you, with regards to addressing those issues, as far as you're concerned, give me a shout. I'm attorney Darren Miller, and that's D-Law.